good morning, Purpose Church. I'm so glad that you're able to join us this morning for week two of our series, Culture Wars. I'm really excited to jump into it this week and get into the word with you. Before we do, would you pray with me wherever you're at, whether you're sitting in your living room or, or driving somewhere? Hopefully, if you're driving, you're safe because it's a little icy out there on this cold Valentine's Day. Uh, but wherever you're at, pray with me real quick. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord, that that, that church is not about a place, but it is your people, God. I thank you, Lord, that, that, that we don't come to hear from a man or a woman, the young or the old, but we come to hear from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. So God, would you teach us something from your word and draw us closer to our Savior this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so week two of Culture Wars. We started this series uh, last week. Pastor Landon brought an amazing word, um, and, and the idea of culture wars is that there's a difference between kingdom culture and the culture that you and I live in, and, and there's this tension between the two cultures. Um, and, and last week, Pastor Landon brought a message on the battle of apathy, and we were declaring war on casual Christianity, and it was incredibly powerful. Um, and this week, we're going to jump into part two of this series. Before I do, let me read our anchor verse that we're, we're going on. It's Romans 12, uh, verse 2. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this, this series is about not conforming to what the world says, but really leaning into what kingdom culture is. And kingdom culture is all about uh, Jesus's primary message. Jesus said that uh, people were, as soon as he started preaching, after he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he went out, he started preaching to people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he talked about this, this idea that heaven was near. Some verses, uh, some translations say the kingdom of heaven is near. Some of them say it is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is within reach. It, it had come. And, and you can kind of see this in Jesus's teaching on prayer when he prays the Lord's prayer. And he says, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so there, there's this reality collision where God's, Jesus is bringing the, the reality of heaven into our reality. And the thing about a kingdom is that it has a king, and our king is Jesus. And so we, we don't just get to kind of have differences of opinion and do things our way if we call ourselves Christ followers. There's a kingdom culture. And so that's what this series is about, uh, the war between kingdom culture and the culture that we live in. And there's four battles that we're highlighting in this series. There's many battles, but, but four specifically. Pastor Landon's was the battle of apathy. And I have the, the honor and the privilege this morning of talking about the battle of isolation isolation. It's icy outside. The battle of isolation. Fitting that, that we're at, having to watch this at home today, right, by ourselves. Hopefully you're with some loved ones or some friends online. Throw out a wave emoji in the chat if you're online with us this morning. The battle of isolation is all about declaring war for real community. Yeah. And those two things are, are uh, completely opposed to each other, isolation and community. And so with Jesus bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, there, there, it, it, it collides with this reality of our culture because our culture is incredibly isolated. It's, we've been called the connected, the connected generation, but it's interesting that though we're called the, the most connected generation, we have the, the highest levels of depression, suicide, and isolation as any time before in our history. You know, this in our, in our current culture, we have the opportunity uh, on social media to be incredibly opinionated, and yet it seems like nobody is heard. So, so these, are, these are tensions, and, and though our culture says that, that we can be seen, we can post anything, we can post everything that we do, are we known by anyone? And so despite the access to potential community, it's almost counterfeit what the world is offering. And, and the kingdom of heaven has, a, has a, a better offer for you this morning. And so I want to I wanna look at two passages of scripture, two kind of stories, and just let the word of God teach us this morning about how to overcome the battle of isolation and how we can declare war for real, genuine community and why that's even important and why we should go after it. So if, if you have your Bibles or your phone has a Bible app, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, we're going to look here first at what real community is. And when, when the, the, the church as it is today was born, 
uh, in the book of Acts, and we see the beginnings of the church. Um, they had a, a radical shift in their culture that I think kind of applies to our culture today. So the context here is that Jesus has just risen, all the prophecy is fulfilled, um, and he tells his, his followers before he goes that he's going to send a helper. There's a promise that is coming. So we're going to pick up Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. And Jesus is saying, it said, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father has promised, which he said, you heard of me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jump a little bit to verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the remotest parts of the earth. So there's a promise of power so that they can go be witnesses. So God's, gonna, God's saying, I'm going to change things and send you to do something, but first I'm going to send my spirit to help you. And this is important because he told them, wait for the promise. Wait for the promise. And it's worth noting uh, that between the time Jesus died and the day of Pentecost was roughly 50 days which is kind of a lot of days if you think about it. And the reason that we know this um, is because the Jewish feast of Passover and Pentecost marked those two days. So Jesus died. This is significant. If you're, if you're kind of a Bible nerd and you like this stuff, this is pretty significant. The Jewish feast of Passover back in the Old Testament was to celebrate when the Spirit of God passed over the children of Israel, and judgment did not come on them, but mercy did. They spread the blood of the lamb in Egypt over their doors, and and death passed over them. And so interestingly, uh, hundreds of years later, Jesus dies on Passover. And so God's mercy comes. Judgment passes over the people with the death of Jesus. That's exciting to me. And so Jesus dies on Passover, and 50 days later, is another Jewish festival. The Jewish people were, were really big into their festivals, and it reminded them of, of things that God had done for them. And so the festival of Pentecost, or the Feast of Pentecost, was actually, interestingly, a celebration of the giving of the law. So it was the, it was the giving of the law. When, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, and, and they had this feast every year to remind them that God had given them the law. And, and on the first Pentecost, back in in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, when Moses first came down with the law, it, it was actually a bad time because they had begun to have some idolatry in the camp, and many people were worshiping this golden calf that Aaron had built, and it was bad news. And actually, the, the Bible tells a story. The ground opened up, and 3,000 people were swallowed into the ground in this major act of judgment against the people's sins. That was the bringing of the law that they reminded themselves of every Pentecost. Every year at that same feast, they would remind themselves of it. So these two, two, two moments are significant as they're waiting, right, for the promise. They're waiting for, for the Holy Spirit to come, this helper that's going to change everything for them. And so uh, the, first, the first Pentecost, 3,000 died, and it's interesting to note, we'll look at it here in a few minutes, that at the birth of the church, uh, when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, 3,000 were added to the church that day. So, so one marked uh, the beginning of law and judgment, and the other marked restoration for all that had been lost, even, even more than those people themselves had lost because it had been hundreds of years. But this is God's restorative plan, so we'll get into that in a little bit. But I just thought that's worth noting before we move on, that as they're waiting for the promise to come, these, these two time periods are passing. Verse 14, if you will, in, in Acts chapter 1. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and, and, and the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all of the brothers. So they were all together while they waited. So community was required prior to their breakthrough. So community was required prior to their breakthrough. And they didn't know the significance of what was about to happen, and they were waiting 50 days. Can you imagine waiting, uh, and Jesus ascends to heaven, and they're like, all right, we're going to go do this thing. We're going to spread this, this message to the world, and nothing happens for weeks. 50 days passes. In fact, when Jesus appeared after, after his resurrection, he appeared to 500 people, scholars say. 500 people. In, in this story in Acts, in the upper room, when the Holy Spirit falls, there's only 120 people present. So Jesus, and, and if you read Matthew 28, he, he commands them to wait. It's not a suggestion. And yet, three, math is hard, 380 people, I think, is, is what the difference is there. 
left. They didn't stay, and they missed the move of God. So that's kind of my first point there is that community is required even before you see the answer to what you're waiting for. So let's pick it up. Acts chapter 2 now. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a rushing wind that filled the house where they were sitting. So the Holy Spirit's about to fall. But look at that verse. Verse 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all together in one place. That's right place, right time, right people. It's required. Community is required. Obedience is required. Let's keep going. And suddenly there came a a wind, verse 3, and there appeared like tongues of fire distributing and resting on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so there's this miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and God shows up. And, and it goes on to say that the, there were Jews from 18-plus different countries from all over the region that were there to, to celebrate the Feast uh, of Pentecost. And so they all heard this. And they, they not only heard it, but they heard it in their own language. And so they, tons of people from a diverse background, uh, people who were even um, not in community with each other. In fact, the Jewish people were, were pretty elitist and almost racist and definitely sexist. And so they were very divisive. And so all this group of very different people is here and they witness this move of God. And then Peter turns around and preaches to them. And he's like, this is, this is what was prophesied in the Old Testament in the book of Joel, that, that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit and, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And so he goes on to this really powerful powerful moment where he's saying both men and women are going to come together in the end in unlikely community and things are going to be different when God shows up. And he, and he culminates this little sermon that he gives in Acts 2 verse 21. It says, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this is powerful. Peter, Peter kind of goes on in this sermon. It's, it's, it's kind of long. It's most of chapter 2. We're not going to read it all today for time. But he, he says, this, this Jesus who you knew was the Messiah, you crucified him. You put him to death. And it's pretty intense. That's a, that's a way to preach a sermon right there. He's like, you are the ones who saw the miracles of God that he was doing, and you killed him. God, it says, godless men put him to death. And then Acts 2.24 says, but God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. It's incredible good news that Jesus overcame death. And it says that they were pierced to the heart and, and, and they said, what do we do? And they're like, well, we're, we're going to baptize you, you know, surrender your lives to Jesus. And so verse 39, their last one I'm going to read right now, it says, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. This is that inclusion, that the beginnings of community that I'm talking about. This is the foundation. We, we need to understand this before we go into anything else today. For all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to himself. So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls to the church. So this radical encounter with the kingdom of heaven, God shows up changes things in in this culture, this Jewish culture. And and for them, it really did change everything. The the Jews were very, very culturally, um, they felt culturally superior, and they looked down on other cultures, and they felt, well, we're the chosen ones of God. You guys, sucks to be you. Um, You don't get it. You don't have it. And so all these people from 18 different, it, it lists 18 in the book of Acts, but it said there were many more regions. So who knows how, how many different uh, people groups were represented there that, that came to celebrate this feast. And God flips the script. When the kingdom of heaven arrives, it often turns things backwards. And so I want us to see a parallel there with our culture and their culture. Uh, what was once a, a culture of division became one of radical community thereafter. They automatically begin acting like Jesus. Look with me in Acts 2.42 right now and see what their response was to both this manifestation of God and hearing the powerful truth of the gospel. 2.42 says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Teaching, fellowship, sharing food, and praying. That, that's, a, that's a sermon series right there. Those, those, that's what they focused on. So they went from divided to automatically responding to the kindness of God in their lives and, and with community. 
Verse 43 says, everyone feeling a sense of awe, and, and the apostles were doing many signs and wonders, 44, and all those who had believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions, and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So their response to God, the kingdom of heaven showing up, was just radical generosity and just loving people. Somebody had a need, oh, I don't need this stuff, I'll help you. I'll, and, and they begin to look like Jesus as they operated in community. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God for having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were divided. Now they're experiencing real community. So the implication for us is that even us, if you look back at our the American history that, that we have, dis, despite sensory, <laughs> excuse me, centuries of division, an encounter with God can radically transform us. An encounter with God can change us. This is the good news of God and his kingdom. And this is why it, this is not, culture wars is not about, you, you know, cultural differences or differences of opinions. This is, this is everything. This is, this is light versus dark. This is good versus evil. This is not like, oh, well, we kind of disagree, so we're going to move on. No, this is literally has the power to change everything in our lives and in our country and in our world. And that's what happened with the church. Thousands saved, massive explosion, because all that happened is they encountered God and they responded with community. Makes our world's offer of false connectedness seem incredibly counterfeit in comparison. So despite the powerful truth that, that we just kind of read through there, um, I would say that a lot of us still um, fight against community. I know I have in the past, and, and, I, and I was kind of wondering why that is. I, I read a recent study that said that the average number of friends that people have is less than one. It's like zero point something friends per person. And that's genuine, real friends who really know you and love you for the way you are and, and accept you, and yet they want to spur you on to better things. Like, I'm talking real friendship, not just like, hey, good to see you, but like live in life with you, there for you, willing to say the hard things to you. Real friends. Less than one. So I, I want to ask you, how many friends do you have? Not Facebook friends, right? Not followers, not acquaintances at work or even at church, but how many people know you? How many people are you open with like that? It doesn't need to be a lot, but is there at least one? And if not, that's okay, because I've been there too. Our nature and the devil work together to fight against us and keep us in isolation. We're naturally, uh, our, our sinful nature, our human side is like, ah, I don't want to be real. That, that sounds like work. That sounds like exposure. That sounds like I don't know if I can trust people. And so we fight against it in a lot of ways. Uh, I wrote down three things. In the battle of isolation, we fight the enemy, we fight our circumstances, and we even fight against ourselves. We fight the enemy because Satan knows that, that God's plan for community gives us power to overcome. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Who are we sharing our testimony with? Our people. Right, So when we're together, we're powerful, we're stronger. Uh, the Bible says that where two or more are gathered, God says, I am with them. So the devil's main tactic is to isolate you, is to get you away. And think about the, the pandemic of 2020. I'm claiming that it was only in 2020 in Jesus' name. It's not going no further. <laughs> the pandemic, what did it do? It made everybody isolate. And even if you had people in your families, most people drove them, their families crazy the whole time. It, the devil wants to keep us isolated. He capitalizes on moments like that to, to trap us into, because when we're alone and we need help, we, we can't call out to anybody. The Bible says as much. So you, you see people going back into old addictions, back into uh, bad mindsets, depressed thinking, um, things like that, because they were isolated. So that's Satan's plan. We also fight our circumstances like sometimes uh, what worldwide pandemic, we can't be in as much community physically. Uh, and so circumstances work against us. And then our own nature fights against us as well in the battle of isolation. So that's why we have to wage war for real community. I want to look at um, a second story here this morning um, to understand why 
in the battle of isolation, uh, we fall. Why, why, why is this a struggle for us? If, if there's truth like Acts chapter 2 that is just so powerful, it's such a picture of God, why wouldn't we run to that? And I think um, there's, there's, Scripture gives us an answer. If you guys uh, have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. This is um, the first picture of broken community. It's the fall of man, this, this broken fellowship. God in himself is a perfect picture of fellowship. He is fully sufficient in and of himself, the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He needs nothing else. He is perfect community in and of himself, yet in his goodness, he creates man. And out of the goodness that, that is in him, out of the love that is in him, he creates man to share in that community, sentient beings who can choose right and wrong and to love him or not. Now, here's where our story picks up in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Follow with me. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said that you should not eat from any tree? This is the beginning of deception. This is the devil's tactic. Did God really say that? Is that, is that really what he said? In fact, it was what God said. It was the only command that he gave them. He said, the garden is yours. The earth is yours to subdue. Just don't eat of that tree. And so the woman said, you know, yeah, we can eat of any tree, but, uh, you know, God said you shouldn't eat from this one or touch it or you'll die. And verse 4, the serpent says, you surely will not die. For God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And this is further deception because they were already created in God's image. They couldn't be more like God already. They were in perfect connection with him, made in his likeness. And so Satan's going after their identity. And it says that the woman saw that the tree was good. She takes a bite, and then she gave it also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now let me pause there real quick as a side note. Adam was there the whole time, and he said nothing. He did nothing. I, actually, I think, man, if you're listening, this is the, the number one biggest sin of men and when there's a battle to be fought and we do nothing. This is, this is the number one thing that the enemy uses is apathy. Pastor Landon preached on it last week. If you haven't heard that message, go back and listen to it. But apathy cripples a man of God because men of God, you were made to fight. Women too, but men specifically, if I could just talk to you for a second, God put a fight in you. And to do nothing is to give victory over to the enemy. Anyways, I don't have time. Let's keep going. Uh, then Verse 7 says uh, of Genesis 3, Then he, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made for themselves loin coverings. Verse 8, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Their, their response was shame, to hide. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? This is significant. God is God, God's initial response to the first sin. This is before the redemption of Jesus and, and God calling us back to him, himself. The first response of God to a sinner was to seek them out. We're going to talk about that here in a minute, but just pay attention to that. God's response to sin is not to condemn you. It's not to say, oh, I knew it. You, you, I was just waiting here with this two by four, waiting to smack you with it. No, God sees you and he's going after you. This is God's plan from the beginning, his redemptive purpose. Your creator, redeemer, is seeking after you. Let's keep going. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, man said, so I hid myself. And he said, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? And, they, and then the woman, Adam turns around and says, well, the woman whom you gave me, she gave, it, gave me from the tree, and I ate it. So Adam's response is blame. So there's, there's, there's rebellion, then there's hiding, then there's blame, and these, this is, these, are, these are responses that we have to, to broken community. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And she said, well, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So she blames as well. So our responses are rebellion, hiding, and blame. And for them, this, this destroyed the only community they had ever known, their connection with God. And this was of epic proportion. It, 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 it was the fall of man, and we have a sin nature because of it. And, and, it, and it had intense consequences uh, for them. But also, think about this for us. We do the same 
thing, I think, with, with community in regards to what, why we fight against it, how we resist it, and the way that looks in our lives. We rebel, we hide, and we blame. But God had a, a plan still there in Genesis to restore community back to himself, to redeem what had been lost and the community that had been broken. If you fast forward in Genesis 3 up to verse 15, and God is kind of dealing out the punishments and the consequences of sin. And interestingly, he's, he talks about uh, the serpent and the woman, and he says, and I will put en- enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So from the beginning, God immediately upon the fall of man set into plan a, a, a plan to redeem us back to him. And that, that, that verse talks about uh, the, the seed of the woman, which was Jesus, crushing the head of the serpent, which is Satan. And though the, the serpent would, would bruise his heel, or some translations say bite his heel, uh, that's the death that was on the cross. It was a minor bruise because Jesus rose back again, like we just read in the book of Acts. So God's plan from the beginning was to defeat this separation and this breakdown in community. I, I think we, we rebel, hide, and blame um, kind of for three reasons. Really, rebellion happened, at least in this story, and I think in our lives too, because of two things, deception and ignorance. And the way that looks in our lives is deception is as far as community, we're applying this to community, remember. The deception is that we don't engage in community because we think people are going to judge us and that nobody's going to get us. And so we kind of hide from community. We, we don't, we're, we're like, ah, that, maybe that's not for me. Or, or another lie, that we, the deception that we tell ourselves, if you're on the other end of the spectrum, either you don't feel like you can engage or you think, I'm good. Like, I got plenty of friends I'm good, but it's shallow and it's not real and it doesn't produce the life-changing fruit like it showed in the book of Acts. And, and so those are kind of deceptions that we tell ourselves and, and that we allow the enemy to, to put on us that kind of derail us from community. And ignorance, we, I think this one's a little more innocent, like the, like the woman was kind of just deceived, honestly. Eve didn't know um, what was really happening. The Bible says Adam rebelled, but Eve was deceived. So I think sometimes we just don't know how to be in community with each other. Like cut yourself a little slack. Maybe you've never been taught or shown how to have genuine friendship. Like I think this was even just a couple of years ago as I started getting involved in church, I looked around and I realized I don't have friends and I don't even know what friendship really looks like. Like I see it on TV. I hear it talked about I don't really have what that is. I don't know what that is. I didn't even know what it looked like. So maybe we're, maybe we're there. Maybe that's you. There's some ignorance or deception going on. So rebel, hide, and blame. The hiding is the shame. Hiding is the shame. Maybe saying, I'm not worthy, actually, to be loved. Maybe that's a place that you're in. Maybe you don't think that or you've, you've tried friendships or you've made some mistakes, and you're like, that's why I can't have friends because I'm just I'm broken. That, that's shame, and that's, that's, what, that's what the enemy was using against Adam and Eve, and I think it's still what happens that breaks down our community now is, is, is we hide in shame, and all it does is push us further into isolation. And so if you've experienced that on some level, this message is for you too. And the last part that I had, rebelling, hiding, and blaming. Blaming looks like pride. Blaming looks like uh, I don't need it. I don't need friends. I'm self-sufficient. I'm good. I, I, I'm, a, I'm the type who likes to be by myself, which is okay. Some people are more introverted than others, and some people are more extroverted naturally than others. But to say that you don't need anyone is to deny the way you were created. God made us for community. So even if you tend to recharge and think better by yourself, God made you to be in connection with other people. And if nothing else, the truth of the word that says that where two or more are gathered, I am there with them. Like we need each other to bring God into our midst. We need a brother or a sister in Christ to encourage us with life giving truth from scripture when we're going through things. The Bible says two are better than one because if one stumbles, the other can pick him up. This is, this is just a reality of human nature. A non-Christian 
like sociologists and, and, and people who study people have, have shown that we need other people. In fact, when a baby is not uh, held and touched and loved and it grows up absent of loving affection, it develops psychological issues because we need others. Okay, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here. So I, I just wanted to show you that in Scripture, the Bible applies, y'all. If I, can just, if I can just say for a minute, the Bible is enough. The Word of God is enough to teach us and instruct us in every way. And so I just wanted to show us that, that what we go through has been gone through, and there's a map and a roadmap to get out of it. And so if Jesus are, is, is the, the, the plan, the seed of woman that would crush the serpent's head, if Jesus is our way to restored relationship and community, then Jesus is our only hope, our only hope in community with each other. And I think more importantly, in our connection back to God, because how can we be genuinely connected to another person if we're not connected to our creator? I don't think it's possible. I've tried. I, I've had fake friendships and, and shallow acquaintances, and it wasn't genuine until I got connected to the source. This is a, a, cre- a, a restorative purpose that God put in the scriptures for us, restoring us back into community, uh, which, as we read in the book of Acts, could change everything. It could change the world. What? What do you think would happen if we actually lived this? If we actually lived out this life-giving, Holy Spirit-filled, God-focused, selfless community? What What would our world look like? Think of our divided world. What would things be like if we came back to the biblical model, the kingdom model of community? Paul talks about this in his letter to the Corinthians. And if any group of people were messed up, it was the Corinthian church. Those people were crazy, man. They were focusing on the wrong things. They were sleeping with their in-laws. They were were just really weird and messed up. And so the whole book of 1 Corinthians is just like a rebuke to get them back on track because, man, they they were messed up. And so if God had purpose for them, that gives us some hope. And Paul talks to them about this, this picture of of all of us being a part of the body of Christ, where Christ is the head, and we're all members or organs of that body. We all have a purpose. And when that body is functioning well and every, every part is doing what it was designed by its creator to do, it shows a picture of Jesus that the world needs to see. See, Jesus in you is the hope of the world. And you can't fully, in your human limitation, express all that is God to everyone. But you and your brother and your sister in Christ and I and everybody at our church and people at the church down the road, as we collectively begin to live our purpose, we represent Jesus to the world. You show your representation in in the giftings that God has given you. I show mine. And, And at the end, the world goes, that's Jesus? The church as a whole, that's Jesus. I want to know more about that. That's what they're drawn to. There's an interesting, I wouldn't call it a dichotomy, but it's an interesting tension that I've run into as as a Christian that whenever I see something in Scripture, I really try to do it more. And so maybe this is you. Maybe you're like, I've tried to be in community. I've tried. I've been burned. You don't know what I've been through. You know, I, I, I tried to have friends. I don't like people. Like, whatever your excuse is, whatever your reasons are, we try to do, and I think we error when we try to do. I think our purpose really, the purpose of every Christian, ultimately, is not to try to be like Jesus, because then that makes it about us and what we're doing. I think our purpose is to, to stare at God for so long that we begin to look like him stare at Jesus so long, look after, look for him, look for him in the word, look for him and what he's doing in your life, long to be with him, long to, to connect with him and just look at him. And before you know it, you start to look just like him. And I think the body of Christ looking like Jesus is exactly what the world needs. I think the main point of community 
is that it points us to relationship with God. And then we just model that in our relationship with others. And maybe you're far from that. Maybe, maybe you, either the, the model of community or even just feel like you're far from God. Can, can I encourage you this morning that God is actually coming after you and that nothing that you've ever done could ever make him not want to come after you. Adam and Eve literally did the exact opposite of what God told them. They broke. That's like, that's like think, of a, think of a marriage, and they just did the most offensive thing. They, they went after another. They went after something else besides their first love. And God's response was to pursue them. And that's his response to you today. He's coming after you. He wants you. He loves you. He sees your sin, and actually your sin is bad. My sin is bad. And we break humanity. We break community. We break our lives with our actions, and it's very serious. And God is not flippant about sin. It's very serious to him, but his love is stronger. The Bible says that mercy triumphs over judgment, and God loves you, friend. If you're listening to this, if this message got to you online somehow, You need to know that God loves you so much that he died for you so that that sin that was separating you no longer does. So I'm going to pray. And if if you would like to be a part of that, if you want to follow Jesus, if you say, God, I need your love. I, I need that. I need some community. I need community with God. I need community with other people. Wherever you are in that, just know that God is reaching for you today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the cross of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed that paid for the sins that we deserved to be punished for, God. But your mercy was greater. Your mercy was greater. Thank you, Lord. God, everybody praying with me, would, would, you, would you show them in their heart, God? They need only believe. The word says that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So if that's you today, call on him. Say the name of Jesus, even if it's in your head or in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, help me. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.